Hello. So, my deck is a basic guide to survive in the App Store. It is basic and it is only going to get you survival. It's not necessarily going to get you growth. This deck contains two things, a lot of gifts and my experience over the past four or five years working with startups, of which most have failed because of not having these points. So first, I'm going to talk about me, as you do when you're talking. Um, according to 16 Personalities, does MD use 16 Personalities? You should go, for, go check it out, it's fun. You can give it to your friends and figure out what they're really like inside. Um, I'm an explorer, and this is very much how I approached the app store when I started working on it about four years ago, four and a half years ago. Basically just picking things up, shaking it, turning it to pieces, trying to put it back together. If it didn't work, it goes in the bin, and we start again. So that leads us nicely onto what I do next. I've got a YouTube channel where basically I've got about a year of me doing 60 second videos on app marketing. So if you've got between a minute and six minutes a week to learn about app marketing, head over there, check it out, and you can ask me questions and I'll respond usually. So, as cheesy as it might sound, your DNA will be important to survive in, in the app store. Um, how, you may, how your business runs and how you guys operate will be really important because, well, we'll go into it in a minute. This is a thing that you hear all the time in startups. Like failing fast. For me, it's not just about failing fast. It's testing things quickly, building, releasing, just doing things as quickly as possible. Because if you're not fast, you're, you're basically just going to die. Everybody else out there is moving very quickly. They've got years of experience on you. And they have years of data. So you need to be really, really fast. You need to fail fast. You need to change marketing channels fast, you just need to be super, super quick. The next is you need to be really, really aggressive. So if you are looking, for instance, if you're doing paid ads or something, and you think that, it look like, that the data looks like it might be working, but it's not quite there yet, there's a good chance that it won't get there. So you need to make that call really quickly. You need to decide whether you're gonna keep that channel or keep that function in the app or get rid of it really, really fast because users just, they don't care. There, there's no, there's very little brand loyalty. All the brand loyalty in the app store is commanded by about 1% of the apps. So you need to be super, super aggressive. And the last point, so it's made up of three points. The last point is something that isn't necessarily something that you would relate with being aggressive and being fast. You need to be lovable. If your users don't love your app, and I'm not sitting there, I'm not saying that they're sitting there on your app going, oh, I just love this app, it's great, it's the best thing ever. They just need to use it all the time and not consider using somebody else's app because of the way yours functions or doesn't function, or because somebody else's app does something that yours doesn't. So if you can get your users to look at you like you're looking at this wee dog just now, you're doing well. If you've got that, you might not even need to be fast or aggressive because they love you. And love and everything indeed starts with product. You, if you're going to get into the app stores, um, you're going to have to have a good product. It's going to have to be pretty robust coming out the gate because if it's not and you're pushing out there and, and getting people driving people to your app it's basically dead users and dead money spent so you're going to have to start with product and I'm going to show you one chart which hopefully you guys will see as a massive reason why you need to have a good product and that's because of the growth of the amount of apps that are entering, entering the app store every single year it's, grow it's still growing, it's, that was January's data, and I actually thought that this would normal out in January. I thought the, the growth of the app stores had really, really slowed, but it jumped again. So what this essentially means is, for every app out there, there is probably about 
10 other apps that somebody else could use instead of using yours. So you, this is why you need to make sure that your product is great and fast and user friendly because they can change you in a minute. Now this is deliberately blank, right? Does everybody know what an MVP is? Minimal viable product? So this is the minimum product that you can release into the App Store, or in general, if it's web or anything, that would satisfy a user's need. And you need to release your MVP plus whatever magic you're going to put on top of that. I've got a couple of checks that I go through to try establish what an MVP is, because I can't tell you what it is. This is why this is blank. It's different for every industry and every niche. So this is an audit that I would do on maybe five or six of the main competitors out there. So it's, you've got to go after your best competitor, right? Your best competitor might not necessarily be technologically the best competitor out there, but they're going to be the ones that everybody talks about and has most brand awareness, I'd say. So I'd focus my time on that, not necessarily on your smartest competitor. And the things that I look at, because I really hate doing audits, it takes ages. Um, well, some audits take ages. This one can be really, really quick. You need to figure up figure out how they're handling signups, how are they gathering information? Are they using social? Are they just using Facebook for login or Google Plus or Twitter? Are they doing it through email addresses? Um, what is the BFFs? And that was totally accidental, but I like it. Um, what's the benefit features and functions of your competitor's app? So what is the benefit to the user for them using it? What are the features that enable that benefit? And what are the functions that create the features. The functions part, if you're not technical, like five, 10 minutes with a developer or anybody is technical and they should be able to figure out what um, your competitors are doing in the background of the app to, to get the features and the benefits. So that's quite easy to work out if you've got like 10 minutes of a developer's time. Communication is super, super important and um, we'll go into this in a bit. How, like, what, how are they communicating? So what tools are they using to communicate? Are they using push notifications? Are they using SMS? Are they using email? So you need to figure out, so install their app, start using it, start looking to see what communications are doing. I'm going crazy with this laser pointer. <laughs> when are they communicating is an interesting one as well because they might have learnings that you guys don't have already. So best time of day. Um, is probably the most useful one. When, when's the best time of day or week or month of the month? So this is going to, because you've got to install the app and kind of wait for the notifications, just have a spreadsheet sitting on the side and just whenever they send you a notification, don't clear it, just log the time um, and when it happened. The other part of it is the why. And I think the why is the most important because it's essentially a trigger. Why should a user click on that notification? What are you telling them? What, is, what are your uh, competitors telling their users to get them to click on that? Because they, they might have learned a use of language that you guys don't know yet because you might not have any data. So basically, if you copy all of that, you're not going to start off with nothing. You're, um, you're going to hopefully have their learnings into your app at the beginning. And taps to conversion is another one that I kind of look at. Now, you all know what your conversion point is in your app, hopefully. If you don't, you need to figure that out before we even get to that. Um, but looking at how long it takes for a user to convert, how many screens do they need to go through, how many times in seconds, um, do you think you can make it better? Can you, If you made it longer, would it, made it make it better? So you need to have a look at their app and basically copy all these points before you release your MVP. And also add whatever you're going to be on top because you don't want to be just another or same as because there, then there's no incentive for somebody to install. So I call recently named the app dance, but I'm up for uh, taking some suggestions on the name. 
So basically, once you've really, you've got your MVP and you think it's as good as it can be, you want to do, kind of move through a little cycle. You just don't go out crazy spending all your cash um, on promoting the app. You need to be a bit more tactical about it. You want to push, hold for a few minutes after you've minutes, days, weeks, whatever. Um, hold for a period of time and then work on your retention. So pushing is any channel at all that's available to you guys. Um, usually when you're working with apps, a nice low hanging fruit is Facebook, but that doesn't really work in gaming, gaming gambling from what I understand. Um, a channel that could be useful to you guys is Apple Search Ads. It's their new search platform. I don't think they stop you from bidding on gambling and betting terms. Uh, but you basically, you want to push out as hard as you can and as much as you can for a short period of time. Um, and that could be through you know, PR, uh, paid ads on Google, anything at all, any way that you've got to do it. It could be emailing um, your current user base. And once you've did that and you've got people to install the app, you need to find a trigger. I told you there was a lot of gifts in this. Um, so what usually happens is people will install the app and just leave it there and not use it. So you need to find a way to trigger a user to open the app. And that kind of goes back to what I was saying is like kind of copy your competitor's communication and use what they're using and do it at the same time they're doing it as a base until you find out what works for you. But yeah, you need, so you need to find a trigger. And the trigger could be a push notification. It could be another email to alert them to sign back into the app. But you need to figure out what works for you guys. Next bit is hold. Just hold on to it for a few minutes and check the data and watch how people are interacting. This could be a seven day cycle or it could be a two week cycle. I think seven days might work well if it's sports betting and stuff. Uh, actually, two weeks is probably better because you get to see two sets of data next to one another. Um, but you need to hold and analyze your data before you start pushing again, or you're just going to throw money down the toilet, essentially. Once you've figured out how to trigger them and how to get them into the app, you need to figure out a hook, how to get them coming back into the app without necessarily having to trigger them all the time. So this is an app that doesn't have a hook, right? This is retention numbers, which is a bit of a holy grail. And um, we'll go into that in a few minutes of why that's important. But if you have to keep pushing and triggering to get this to go blue, your app's essentially failing. So you, you need to find a hook, a way to bring people in to the app and get them coming back regularly without you having to keep telling them to come back in. And it takes, it could take months to figure that out, realistically. But as long as it's continuing to grow from zero upwards, you're in a good place. So once you've managed to figure out the hook, you've got retention, you've retained. And you'll see this, here. This, oh, but these um, graphs are coming from iTunes Connect. If anybody's used the App Store yet, you'll, you'll know where to find this. Um, it's in the top of the navigation, actually. So retention is the holy grail. If you can figure out how to get people in and constantly coming back without having to constantly trigger and push people to come back into the app, you're doing well. But it takes a period of time. It's, it's, it's unquantifiable. Um, many apps don't figure it out before they go out. So once you've figured out your MVP and you've figured out how to trigger and retain, you can start looking at App Store optimization. And the reason that I'm telling you guys to wait before you focus on this is because good product and retention numbers are a massive part of the algorithm when you're doing app store optimization. Um, so let's assume that you've got a good MVP and you've got a bit of retention. What do you do next? What, what parts of the algorithm do you need to cater to to start ranking in the Play Store? First of all, we're going to go through some tools. 
there is an infinite number of tools for ASO. Like, there's a new one every week. It's ridiculous. Most of them do the exact same thing and charge different prices. I don't know why. Um, App Annie's probably the biggest and clearly the most expensive in the market. I use AppTweak, and the, the reason I use these guys is just because they're really clear in where they get their data, and they're always happy to answer questions, where the rest of them don't really answer questions as honestly or openly as AppTweak App do, but that's, that's the reason I use it. But realistically, the only tools that you need when you're doing ASO are a keyboard tracker, so you just to benchmark your performance, a review miner, so that's so you can pull out all your reviews into like a spreadsheet or something and start looking at the sentiment, starting to look at what people are saying. Maybe they're suggesting product features that they want. Maybe they're using keywords that you can use when you're optimizing. But it's really, really important to look at reviews because, again, it's a massive part of the algorithm. So ignoring them is not something I would ever suggest. The next is a push service, but technically you should have taken care of the push service when you're doing the MVP because the, the competitors are using a push service, so you should have a push service. There's a million and one push services out there as well. So it's just, just Google it, there's so many of them. A review push, ser push service, another one that you should have got during your MVP build. And that is essentially whenever you're using an app um, every now and again, you'll get a little notification asking to review the app. That's a review push service. There's lots of them that are really quite clever, or you could build your own, but if you're just doing an MVP, just use the third party. Most of them are free and intelligent. Whoop. That's what the black button does, I was wondering. Um, the deep link service, this is really important. But it's pretty difficult to communicate without actually showing you things. So like afterwards, if you want to know what, a bit more about deep linking services, come and talk to me. Essentially, deep linking services stop you losing people in the funnel. All right, so if you're doing a push, it will hedge against you losing people because they weren't maybe sent given the right um, path to conversion. So maybe they were sent to the App Store instead of Google Play or just a, a generic landing page. Good deep linking services will figure out what device they're on and send them to the right store. Really good deep linking services will take them to directly into the bit of content um, that you were trying to show them initially. So it's, it's very, very important for reducing your cost per install and not losing people in the funnel. So this is basically keyword research, which I'm pretty sure all of you will be pretty good at. Um, in the ASO world, we don't actually have any reliable keyword tools, none whatsoever, because the app stores don't give us any keyword data back. You'll see a lot of tools out there saying that they have keyword data or some sort of keyword data. It's not useful at all, and I could do an entire talk on why that is, but um, I won't at the moment. Um, so basically, you need to use your intuition and match it with your product. Um, check Google Trends to make sure you don't push out at the wrong time. I think the major difference in ASO and SEO is we have to run keyword cohorts. So we need to bundle up keywords into kind of similar groups and run them at different times to figure out what the lifetime value of a particular group of keywords would be. It's the only, it's the only big difference that we need to do. Uh, and it's worth doing because it means you don't spend time on keywords that aren't valuable. So back to reviews. Reviews. If you don't have reviews, essentially you don't rank. Uh, it doesn't matter if you do an incent campaign or a boost or anything like that. You essentially don't rank. And this is a graph of somebody that w didn't have any review acquisition prior to um, working with us. And they started here. And it just basically over about a period of a week and a half, it started to jump up. And we just picked up keywords along the way. And this is just reviews, this is nothing else. They were doing limited uh, app installs, maybe a 20 or 30 a day um, through Facebook. But essentially, if you don't have reviews, you're not moving past this area. So it helps you move up. It also helps you to acquire keywords that you didn't think of ranking for before. So these keywords started to come through. We were just tracking a whole bunch of keywords. Um, 
and we weren't necessarily targeting them. So the power of reviews can't be underestimated. You absolutely need reviews. And that's why you need to have a push service in there and figure out how to get people to give you a review. Important note about reviews, you cannot incentivize somebody to give you a particular type of review. You can't t say, give us a five-star review or anything. Apple will just not allow your app into the App Store because um, mobile gaming companies have been doing it for years and they've cracked down it. So you can incentivize reviews. You just can't tell them to give you a five-star review or a four-star review. You just need to say, we'll give you X if you leave us a review, which is useful. Back to retention. So I know gambling currently can't operate in Google Play. I say currently because I'm hearing rumors that they might be opening it up. Um, but Google Play's algorithm and the App Store's algorithm are relatively similar when it comes to retention. And because Google are better at algorithms and better doing updates, um, they do more regular updates on the actual algorithm, so the stores are, I'm not gonna say somewhat cleaner, but at least they try. Apple doesn't even try, they just it's just garbage in there a lot of the time. So essentially, in the beginning of November, they decided to tackle what's called incent, incentivized installs. And that's essentially, you go to a network, it could be an ad network or particularly just a, an incentivized install network. And you pay people to install your app. Now, it works. It does. It will boost you in the ranking. Well, up until November, it would work really well, and it still does work to a certain degree. Um, but what Google has decided to do is essentially the only way I can figure out how they would be enforcing something like this is to look at the installs and then look at the retention and if retention is like zero compared to what your usual install retention is, then they'll ignore all of these uh, installs. That's why we go back to product again and talk about why it's very important to figure out how to retain and hook people. So when you are getting installs, if you do decide to run an incentivized install campaign, uh, which will boost your rankings, what you want is once those rankings have been got and you're starting to get um, installs organically, you want those to be hooked and retained so Google doesn't identify Google or Apple because Apple just do a similar thing. It's just not as um, impactful at the moment, but I'm pretty sure it's going to happen this year. Um, so essentially, it hedges against you getting caught for spamming, essentially. And... These are just a few things. These are the, th the key things that I want you to remember. And if, if you go back and look at the deck, these are the things I just want you to remember. You have to have a good MVP, right? Before, we, before you think of reviews or anything like that, if you don't have a good product, you will get wiped out in the App Store, no doubt. You will not survive. I've seen people with good products get wiped out. So if you come with a rubbish product, you will get wiped out. Um, push, trigger, hook before you push again. So try your best to figure out what the triggers and the hooks are before you spend any more money on acquisition. It might not be possible. You might lose everybody in the first push and need to start again. But do not just go funneling cash into your acquisition because it is not what wins the game. Every, every single startup I've ever worked with that has failed has failed because they have not had retention. And they cannot raise money because they don't have retention. Hockey stick growth is not something VCs want to hear about. So that, I don't know how long that took. Is it, essentially? And I can ask, answer Thank questions. you very much, Nick. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? No, that's great. Um, well, thank you very much, Nick. Yeah. Oh, sorry, we've got a few questions on the Slido here. Uh, so first up, um, we're blocked from Google AdWords due to showing live odds and no gambling license. Any chance of getting an app on their Play Store? Side loaded, worth a shot. I am not sure. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll go on to the next one because that is kind of hard to answer. So, yeah. would it be acceptable to allow users entry into a competition based competition on people performing installs, leaving reviews, not necessarily asking for the five star reviews? Yes, probably. They, so the problem with that, the good thing about Google Play is it's like 
it's all automated, all the, the app submissions. So unless you're doing something really dodgy, the algorithm catches, you can, um, you can get away with a lot of stuff, right? But play, uh, the App Store is entirely based on how somebody feels that day, I'm pretty sure. Because I've had things pushed back into review just for, for really nothing. So I would definitely try it and see if you can get it through and let it work for as long as you can make it work until they push you back and say you need to change the language. But just go for it. Just, just definitely don't say that you're, we're going to give you this for a five star or a four star. You cannot tell them what to leave as a review. You can only ask them to leave the review. Great. And um, before we finish, is there any final questions from the audience? Yeah, we've got one just here. Hi, I'm Dimos. Hello. I just want to ask if you had to decide um, one or two uh, metrics that you consider the most important, what uh, those would be? Um, just for just for an app. Yes. Yeah. Cost per install and retention rate. So cost per install is a holy grail in gaming and mobile gaming, and well, not your gaming, but you know, computer games gaming, um, and most businesses. Well, so there's maybe three, not two. So there's cost per install, lifetime value, um, and retention. And obviously, retention and lifetime value are closely related. So it, it would be those three if you focus on them. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Nick. Cool. Uh, if you have a round of applause, please.